Uh, let's just open up in a word of prayer, okay? Father God, I just thank you for bringing us here this morning. I just thank you for um, who you are and how you've uh, really taken hold of our lives, how you're reigning in our lives, how you're the king of um, our souls and just the king here on earth, Lord. And we just seek to make you bigger. Uh, we just seek to, we just want to see you um, huge and big in people's lives, Lord. Pray that you would show yourself this morning through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <coughs> All right, how many of you guys collect something? Anything? Anybody collect anything? What do you guys collect? Anything? Pencils? Cool, cool. Anybody else collect anything else? Pen dispensers? Cool. Are some of those worth a lot? Cool, cool. Anybody else collect anything? Hardly anybody collects anything these days. Huh? <laughs> Magic cards. Magic cards. <laughs> Basketball cards. What? Basketball Computer cards. Games. Computer games. Yeah. What do you collect? Paul? Basketball cards. Basketball cards. Cool. I collected baseball cards when I was a kid. I collected baseball cards. Nobody likes baseball these days anymore, so nobody really collects baseball cards anymore. But I remember um, I had a whole shoebox. Every time I went to Target, you know how Target has this like card section? I would always go, hey mommy, can I get um, just one pack of cards? And every time we go shopping, I'd go, oh, I hope we're going to Target, not Mons or something, you know, because I mean, maybe get a pack of cards, right? And then um, I remember my favorite set of cards was called Top Stadium Club, okay? It was like, you know, most cards are just a piece of cardboard, right? But Top Stadium Club, was like glossy, you know, it's shiny, right? And they had like some gold like lettering on it. And I was like, ooh, ooh. It like, you can, and then you open it and it smells different. <laughs> <laughs> so I love Top Stadium Club. They're my favorite like cards. And then among Top Stadium Club, there's a special set like that was even more rare called Top Stadium Club Members Choice. <laughs> okay. I don't know why they called it that. But it had even more gold lettering on it. And it was like, they had different artwork. Instead of like just like people swinging the bat or whatever, they had the guy dressed in a suit or something like that. <laughs> and he just still have like a glove and his hat on, but he'd be in a suit. So they had like cool, like special full photography for members' choice, right? And I remember I would get all these cards, and then I'd get like a really good rookie card that's worth like 20 bucks or something. And I'd be like, oh, this is awesome. I have a rookie card that's worth 20 bucks. And then I go to my friend and I go, hey, I'll trade you for your member's choice card that was only worth like five bucks or something. So I'd trade down just to get member's choice because I thought member's choice was so awesome, right? And then a few late, years later, maybe like five years later, we had a garage sale and I got bored of um, my baseball cards. So I sold all of my baseball cards for five dollars. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> it was like a whole like, huge thing of baseball cards that my mom was like, hey, they offered $5. I, I put my own label, 20 on it. But then they're like, oh, they offered 5 for it. Do you want to sell? It's like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I sold all my baseball cards for $5. So that was what you would call kind of a uh, bad investment. Because <laughs> first of all, I got some cards that were worth like 20 bucks and stuff. And I would trade down to get those $5 cards, members' choice cards. And then I traded that, all of them, for like $5 total, <laughs> right? So that was not really a good investment. Um, today, we're going to go and we're going to dive into the Word and in Matthew chapter 19. Um, and we're going to talk about my favorite character in the Bible, Jesus. <laughs> and what he had to say about what was a good investment. What was a good investment in life? My baseball cards are obviously not a very good investment. <laughs> uh, maybe if I kept them now. You know what? I actually looked up how much Top Stadium Clubs are worth now. They're worth the members' choice. They're only worth $2 now. So I actually went down in value since I was a kid. It's pretty sad. Anyway, <laughs> bad investment, but Jesus is going to talk to us about what's a good investment. Uh, so let's look at Matthew chapter 19. And I will read for you guys. This is one of my favorite passages in the Bible. One of the passages in the Bible that really changed my life the most. Uh, verse 16, starting verse 16. 
about the rich young man, but we're mostly going to talk about the second half of that, okay? So not the part that I usually talk about. All right, so um, let me read that for you. Matthew 19, verse 16. Now a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good, Jesus replied. There is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, obey the commandments. Which ones, the man inquired. Jesus replied, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother and love your neighbor as yourself. All these I have kept, the young man said. What do I still lack? Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, Go sell your possessions and give them to the poor, or give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Then Jesus said to the disciples, I tell you the truth, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Peter answered him, We have left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth that the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me, will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses, or brothers, or sisters, or father, or mother, or children, or fields, for my sake, will receive a hundred times as much, and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. This is in the book of Matthew. And this is Jesus talking, okay? In the beginning of the book of Matthew, when Jesus comes out and he begins his ministry on earth, he has that kind of a phrase that he uses. He calls out to people. And this phrase is, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. What does he mean by that statement? What he means is, Hey, I'm leading a rebellion. That's basically what he means. He's saying, the kingdom of Caesar, the kingdom of these people, is going to be gone. But the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, is coming near. And he is the one who's going to be bringing that kingdom to earth. Okay? And this is exactly what the disciples thought. The disciples are thinking, oh shoot, we're, this is awesome. We're going to follow uh, the, the Messiah. We're going to follow the person who's going to save us from, from the Romans. And he's going to have his own kingdom. And we're all going to be, you know, we're going to be in league with the best, you know, <clears throat> the guy who's going to rule. And it's going to be really awesome. So I want to get in on it first, you know. It might be tough now, but when Jesus becomes king, I'm going to be at his right hand and left hand. I'm going to rule with him. I'm going to be rich because Jesus is going to be rich. It's going to be awesome, right? That's what the disciples were thinking. That's what most of the people who heard Jesus talk were thinking. They were thinking Jesus was going to bring this, a rebellion, a leader rebellion, and he's going to set up a kingdom for himself, and they were going to be a part of it. They were going to be a part of it, okay? Um, so that's kind of like the background of what's going on here in this, in this passage. That's what the disciples were thinking. That's what all the people around him were thinking. Okay? And he comes up to this rich young man, right? Now, or the rich young man came up to him and says, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Okay? What good thing must I do to get eternal life? Now, this rich young man, he was thinking spiritually, right? He's not thinking about this earthly stuff, like kingdoms, like like, like riches, like the disciples were thinking about. He was thinking about something spiritual, the next life, eternal life, right? And so he goes through this conversation with him, and he says, you know what? To get the next life, to get eternal life, give all you have to the poor and follow me. 
right? And the guy can't do it. He can't do it because he said, you know what, I have, I have riches. It, it says in the Bible, it says, um, the young man heard this. He went away sad he had, because he had great wealth. He couldn't give up his wealth to get the things in the next life. Okay? So, we have this guy who seems spiritual. And then we have Peter. Okay? Peter hears this and is like, oh, shoot. There's this guy who's, um, he can't give up his wealth for the kingdom of God. But I am going to give it up. I am not to give up everything. So, Peter asks, asks questions. He says, we have left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? He asked Jesus this question. <clears throat> okay? How many of you guys have ever asked a question that you kind of were expecting a certain answer for? Right? Uh, sometimes Cindy's like, hey, um, can you, you know, clean the kitchen or something like that? Or can you, and then I'm like, uh, do I have to, <laughs> right? And I know if I like kind of whine a little bit, she'll be like, Okay, fine, I'll do it, right? And I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> so I'll just like whine a little bit and Cindy will go, okay, fine, I'll do it. And then of course I feel bad at that point and then I do it. <laughs> but I kind of ask that question kind of wanting to hear something, right? Kind of wanting to hear something. Um, a lot of times Cindy asks me, oh, do you think I... Uh, how do you think I look? Or what do you, do you think I'm pretty, right? I'm like, of course you're beautiful, right? <laughs> but she asked that question kind of, you know, wanting to hear that specific answer. That's what Peter was doing here. You know, what do you think? He's like, oh, uh, that guy wasn't willing to leave anything for you, but, you know, we were willing to leave everything. So what's going to be for me? What, what, kind of, what, what am I going to get, right? <laughs> this is Peter. He's like, what am I going to get, right? So... What does Jesus say to that? Does Jesus say, come on, Peter, stop thinking about this stupid reward that you're going to get. I know you want reward. Stop thinking about that. That's not what this is about. That's not what Jesus said. And that, when I read that, I was like, whoa, kind of shocked, right? Jesus doesn't say that to Peter. Do you know what Jesus says to Peter? Jesus says, guess what? This is what you're going to get. You're going to get to be... You're going to get to rule over one of the tribes of Israel. You're going to get a hundred times what you've left. You're going to get riches. You're going to get land. You're going to get children. You're going to get a hundred times what you've left. That's exactly what Peter wanted to hear. That's exactly what Peter wanted to hear. It's just like when Cindy asked me, oh, how do I look? And I just tell her exactly what she wants to do. <laughs> right? I tell her she's beautiful. And that's what Jesus was telling Peter. He was telling Peter exactly what he wanted to hear. You could just even see Peter smile when Jesus says this. Jesus, Jesus says, You who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones. You can see Peter's going, Thrones? <laughs> <laughs> Judging the 12 tribes of Israel. He, Peter's a nobody. He's a fisherman, right? And then now he's going to judge the 12 tribes. He's going to be a ruler, you know? And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or fathers or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much. He's going to get fields, riches, land, you know? You can just see Peter break into a smile, you know? And I just, when I read this, I'm thinking, that is weird. That's weird that Jesus didn't rebuke Peter and say, no, it's not about money. It's not about riches. It's not about wealth. It's about, you know, eternal life or something. So there's a huge contrast between the rich young man who, one, had everything on earth, was rich on earth, but one is the spiritual. And Jesus said, no, that's not what I'm looking for. And then there's Peter, who has nothing on earth, or very little, but wants worldly wealth, wants treasures, and Jesus gives him exactly what he wants. Isn't that weird? I just thought that was so strange. How, Jesus is a spiritual guy. Why is he doing this? And then I looked up the, 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 the biggest passage that came to my mind after just thinking about this question is um, 
Um, Matthew chapter 6, this is the same book. Matthew chapter 6, 19 to 21. You guys don't have to look it up, I can read it for you. It says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. But where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And I thought, can this verse give me uh, kind of an answer to this question I have in my head about what's going on with the rich young man in Peter? And it says, do not store up for yourself treasure on earth. I'm like, yeah, that's exactly what he told the rich young man. But store up for yourself treasures in heaven. And yes, that is exactly what he told Peter that he was going to get too. He told him he was going to get treasure. So I thought it was weird that Jesus actually, it turns out, does not tell us, you know, don't want riches. Don't want power. He says, it's fine if you want it. Just invest in the right place. Right? It's about the timing of your riches, not necessarily the type of riches, or not necessarily to be more spiritual. He says, hey, you will have riches. Just invest in me first. Invest in God's kingdom first. Right? And that, so Jesus specifically uses treasure. He uses treasure as his motivation for the disciples. Here he speaks of treasure in heaven, calling it a better investment than investing in treasure on earth. That's what it is. It's not about not wanting riches. He says, fine, you want riches? I will give you riches. Just invest in me first. Invest in the kingdom of God first. I was um, in Northern California. We were visiting, um, and we went to a supermarket, right? And that was the day that, you know, Super Lotto, like, last day to buy the ticket before they, I don't know what it was, 200 million, I don't know, something like that, right? 640 million. <laughs> okay, that's a lot of money, right? So I was at the checkout counter, and the, I was waiting for the person in front of me. Me and Cindy were waiting in line, and then the checkout lady said to said to the guy in front of us, "Oh, you're buying? Are you buying a lottery ticket?" You know, she's like, <laughs> "You know, are you buying a lottery ticket?" And he's like, "Yeah, yeah, I got mine already." He's like, she says to him, oh, remember me, you know, remember your local checkout lady. All I want is $100,000. Okay? <laughs> you know, if you win, just remember me, okay? And then I get, get up there, and then she's like, hey, did you buy a lot of tickets? And I'm like, no. So she didn't say anything to me. <laughs> but the next person came up, and it's like, she's like, oh, did you buy a lot of tickets? She's like, yeah, yeah. And then... He's like, oh, you know, remember me, your local checkout lady. I just need $100,000. And the guy was like, oh, okay, okay. You know? And she said that to every single person in the line. Oh, did you buy a lot of tickets? Oh, remember me, remember me, you know, if you win, right? So she, you know, I think, I was, afterwards, I'm like, oh, that lady's pretty smart, you know? Like, okay, if she bought maybe 10, maybe 20, maybe whatever amount of lotto tickets she could buy, it would never be as much as the amount of lottery tickets a whole bunch of people could buy, right? So she's using whatever position she has, which is local checkout lady, <laughs> to leverage as much to like ingratiate herself or um, basically she's investing a little bit of relationship in these people saying, hey, remember me, remember me. She's putting her hope in other people, not just in her own lotto tickets, right? Just in case they win. Just in case they win. What's the investment? A couple words. Oh, remember me. That's her investment. Her return, potentially, $100,000. I don't think she got $100,000, but who knows? Maybe the <laughs> But that strikes me as somebody who's making a pretty decent investment. Very little, little um, investment, which is just a couple words. But she's putting her hope in someone else. She's putting her hope in other people, okay? And that's exactly what Peter is doing in this case. Peter knows he's just a little fisherman. He's a nobody before Jesus found him. But he sees in Jesus something that potentially Jesus may become king. In fact, Peter really believes that Jesus 
will become king. So what does he do? He leaves everything and says, I'm just going to follow you, do whatever you want. Look at how loyal I am to you. Look at everything I've given to you. Look, remember me when you become king. Remember how loyal I am to you when you become king. All right? I'm reading this book called Game of Thrones. Has anybody heard of it? It's like a, a story about all these people trying to become king and stuff. And they all, all these lords, they're trying to become king. And the lords have their own servants. You know, the lords don't fight themselves. They're only one person. They need, like, knights. And they need people with swords to fight their wars with them. And the more knights they have, the more likely they'll become king, right? So what do the knights do? The knights are, like, trying to be as loyal. They just say, yes, my lord, yes, my lord. And, and, like, say all the right things. And, and in their heads, they're thinking... Hey, if this guy come, becomes king, I might get to have a lot of riches. I might get to have power. I might get to rule this, rule that, right? And one of the guys becomes king, and, and he tells the, the, the commander of his army, his city, the, of his guard, oh, now you get to become a lord, when before he was just a nobody. He was just a commoner, right? And that guy got to become a lord of a city. And that's exactly what Peter wants here. He wants to become a ruler of Israel, right? One of the judges. He's like, if I just, you know, sell everything, I sell my soul to Jesus, if I just give everything I have to him, just follow him wherever, I'll be able to be one of those rulers. So the thing is, the rich young man, he didn't understand the true investment that he was making. He thought he had wealth on this earth. Therefore, he didn't need more wealth. He was cool where he was. Peter realized he had nothing, and he had to invest in a startup, so to speak. Okay? And people invest in startup companies when they're little. They don't have much. So then when they become big and go public like Facebook or whatever, they'll become rich. Right? That's what people are trying to do, and that's what this disciple was trying to do. So what does that mean for us? What does that mean for us? What it means is that we need to invest in God's kingdom, obviously, right? We need to see, I mean, we are spending a lot of our time on different things here on earth. Maybe we're trying to make money. Maybe we're trying to further our career. Maybe we're trying to get good grades. Maybe we're trying to get into a good college. Maybe we're trying to just beat the next level on a video game. Okay? <coughs> we are investing our lives in a lot of different things. But God is calling us to invest our lives in his kingdom. Okay? I have this problem too. Sometimes I'm, I think, why should I, you know, serve in Sunday school? Or why should I be a youth advisor? Why should I sacrifice my relaxing evenings where I love, I love to be at home alone and just on the internet and doing whatever. Why should I try to hang out with people? <laughs> right? I, why should I um, wake up early to read my Bible? Why should I pray? There's no real reward for any of this stuff. All I do is like serve in church and just get burnt out and I don't get any real reward. But you know what has real reward? You know what has real reward? I could be working overtime to get a promotion so I can get more money and I can get more respect. That's a real reward. I could be playing frisbee, you know, practicing my throws. So then when people go, oh, you're awesome, Daniel, you're an awesome frisbee player. I'm like, yeah, that's a real reward, right? <laughs> I could be studying and getting good grades and get into an awesome college so that my parents would be like, oh, I'm so proud of you. So that other kids, other people are like, oh man, you got into that school, you're so smart. That's a real reward, right? Wrong, absolutely wrong. Those things are not real rewards. Those are worthless. I'm telling you, they're worthless compared to the reward that God has in store for you. Those things are worthless. Don't think that it's not real what Jesus is talking about here. Don't think you won't really get real Gold. You will. I'm telling you, you will get real houses. You will get houses and mansions. 
you will get real status. God will give you true status. You will have real love from real family. Okay? If you invest in God's kingdom. The rewards on earth are so temporary and crappy, okay, <laughs> compared to the rewards of God's kingdom. Okay, this, this is another problem that I have, okay? Another problem that I have is how we talk about heaven, rewards in heaven. Oh, yeah, we're going to sit up in heaven, and there's going to be streets of gold, and we're just going to sit there. We have all this awesome stuff, but what? But that's not what the Bible describes heaven as what? The Bible, if you look and read into the Bible, it doesn't describe heaven as some ethereal place up there. Okay? First of all, God's kingdom, is his goal is to bring heaven to earth. Okay? When Jesus says the kingdom of heaven has come, he's preaching to people on earth, saying the kingdom of heaven has come to earth. What it's going to be, it's going to be heaven on earth. So it's not some ethereal place. This is the place where it's going to be. Okay? This is where heaven is going to be. Heaven is where God reigns. Okay? And when God reigns here on earth, it's going to be real stuff. You're going to have money to actually buy real stuff. Uh, one of the things I really want is a carbon fiber bike. Okay? <laughs> a carbon fiber road bike. Right? Because my bike is a steel thing that weighs 30 pounds. Okay? Where I was like, oh man, I really want a 15 pound bike. That'd be awesome, right? I could go really fast. But, you know, they cost 2,500, 3,000 bucks. So I'm asking these like, heck no. <laughs> so what do I get? I will never have my bike. I'm thinking I will never have my bike in my entire life. This sucks. You know what? I will. <laughs> I will. Because in heaven, We'll have so many riches that we can actually buy real stuff that we really will enjoy. I'm not kidding. Okay? You will be able to buy real stuff that you really enjoy in heaven. Okay? If you make the proper investment now. If you make the proper investment now. We look online. Me and Cindy, we're like, oh, that's a really cute house. You know? I love that house. Oh, shoot. It's 700 Next, let's look at something in the range of 300. And then we see all these trashy houses. We're like, oh, I guess we'll never get a house. Wrong, you know? Wrong. In heaven, God is promising us mansions, right? Awesome houses that we will really enjoy. These are real things. We really will enjoy them, okay? I don't know if I can get that point across to you strong enough. This, this stuff is real, okay? I remember when I was in co college, I, for those of you guys, you guys probably know, like, you know, I didn't get good grades. It took me like seven or eight years to graduate from college, okay? So what happened? What made me actually, okay, fine, I have to get great, decent grades and graduate. Well, I met this one girl named Cindy, right? <laughs> and she had already graduated from college. She already had a job, and I was like, oh, crap, I'm still in school. This sucks, and it's embarrassing. Right? So, I was like, oh, I better work hard. Boom. First time in my life I got straight A's that semester. Right? Why? What changed? It's because the rewards of graduating from college became real to me for the first time. The status, I, I didn't really care, you know, what people thought of me until I met a girl and I cared what she thought of me. Right? The rewards became real. Let the rewards of heaven be real to you. If you're not striving for heaven, you don't believe those things are real. You don't believe they're real. Okay? The last statement in this passage, it says, but many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. That is an <coughs> ominous statement. It's saying the rich will be poor, and the poor will be rich. It's saying people with high status, high up at different companies, presidents, rulers of this world, will have low status in heaven, in the God's kingdom. But people who are have no status, those are the people who will be high up. Those are the people who will be the rulers. Those are the people who will be respected. Okay? That's what, and this is a general statement. But then, what am I saying? Am I saying that rich people can't go to heaven? 
And by saying that um, if you have a great job and a great career, you're going to have a crappy job and a crappy career in heaven? Am I saying that, hey, if you have, you're respected here on earth, that you're going to be disrespected in heaven? You know what? Maybe. Maybe. That's a general order. But even Jesus in the Bible, he says that, you know, with all things, God, with, with God, all things are possible. But Jesus is giving us a general order. Why, though? Why does that general order exist? Why is it that if you value career here, you're going to get a crappy career in heaven? Why is it that if you have a lot of money, you're going to get, you're going to be poor in heaven? Why is that? And the reason is because it takes a lot of effort and it, it requires you to value money in order to get money here on earth. It requires you to value good grades and getting into college in order to get there here on earth. It requires that. I'm not saying that because you have good grades, you won't get those in heaven. But what I'm saying is that if you value those things above the things of heaven, you will not have anything in heaven. If you value grades, college, riches, your career above God's kingdom, you will have nothing in God's kingdom. Okay? It's not mutually exclusive necessarily, but in general, that's just the way it works. And that's what Jesus is saying here. Okay? So I want to ask you guys to, to take a challenge. Okay? And it's not an easy thing. I'm, it's not an easy thing. What I'm telling you is that when you have the choice to either work overtime maybe and get spend and, and ingratiate yourself to your boss make them happy with you, or serving somebody else, or maybe serving at church. Think about that decision first. Who are you pleasing, your boss, or are you pleasing God? Maybe it's worth it to make an investment in God's kingdom and, get, and not get the next promotion at work. When you're thinking about studying for the SATs the night before the SATs on a Friday night and you're going to skip out on YouTube, Maybe it's worth it to go to youth group and study earlier in the week. Maybe. What I'm saying is that maybe instead of buying a new bike, okay, maybe you should save up that money and give it to church or give it to our missions or give it to charity instead. Maybe that's worth it. Maybe that's a better investment. What I'm saying is that you need to leave time to serve God in your life. If God asks you right now, can you meet once a week with a younger believer and disciple or mentor that person, do you even have time to do that? If God asks you right now, can you support a missionary $100 a month, do you, do you have the money to do that? Well, are, do you have the willingness to do that? Or have you spent that money already? If God asks you to serve on youth core, maybe, do you have time to do that, or are you playing, or are you investing in, I don't know, soccer practice? I don't know if anybody plays soccer. <laughs> do you, um, if God asks you to spend, to serve him by spending a lot of time and energy building up maybe this church, building up Exodus, do you have time to do that? So are you willing to put the energy into doing that? Those are the investments that we're making here, right now, on earth. Those are the investments that Jesus told Peter, you've made the right choice. You've given up everything for me, and that is the right choice. And he's telling the rich young man, you made the wrong choice. You're thinking about some ethereal, like far off, eternal life, when you don't realize, I am eternal life. Follow me. And the young man was not willing to do that. I'm going to ask you guys, are you willing to follow him? Are you willing to really, truly build up his kingdom here on earth? Let's pray. Father God, I just ask you to convict our hearts, to show us the choices in our lives, to allow us to struggle, to allow us to fight, to inspire us to just um, really desire you and want you. Maybe we don't know you. Maybe we don't know who you are. Maybe we don't know how real your riches are. Lord, I pray that you would convict us and show us 
the reality and the truth of how awesome your kingdom is and how much we want it, Lord. I just pray this in your name.